gentlemen, as our panel, uh, distinguished panel, gathers on the stage right now, I would like to do uh, one thing before we start our lunchtime presentation. We have a fireside chat without the fire, but uh, I guarantee you, you'll enjoy what's coming in that discussion. But really, I'm pleased and honored today to recognize some special guests. We have three special guests with us today that I'd like to uh, draw your attention to. Uh, these men have served, uh, served their country wonderfully well, and like to honor three wounded warriors who are at today's luncheon. The first, and I'd ask them as I call their name to stand, is Staff Sergeant John Dedimore, and he is recovering from gunshot wounds. Uh, he served uh, and in October 2011 with the 3rd Combat Engineer Battalion in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Um, he, uh, in service to his country, was wounded. And ladies and gentlemen, I would ask you to recognize Staff Sergeant John Dedimore. This is a stand up. We are. And if, uh, if I could also at the same time then, as they are standing, and you are too, because they deserve this honor, Sergeant Jared Miller, 3rd Battalion, 4th Marines, injured in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. And finally, Corporal Casey Allison, injured February 2014, in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. Gentlemen, thank you. At this time, I would like to uh, pass the torch and the microphone to a uh, good friend and close associate, uh, Admiral Pete Daly, who, uh, in partnership with AFCEA and USNI, uh, we're honored to have a 25 year relationship and production of this event here in San Diego. Uh, and Vice Admiral retired Pete Daly will take charge and make introductions and hold on to your seats. Okay, well, thank you, Bob. Uh, we're very honored to have the three sea service leaders here with us today um, on this panel that we do. Um, I'll do a couple of short introductions here, and then uh, we'll go right into questions. Uh, and uh, I'd ask the audience to think of, uh, think of some questions that you might have, but we'll, get, we'll break the ice up here, and uh, we'll get right into it. Uh, quick introductions, which are not totally needed but should be acknowledged. Uh, intro General Dunford. General Joe Dunford is a 36th Commandant of the Marine Corps. He's a ground combat officer who's commanded at all levels. He commanded the Regimental Combat Team Number 5 in OIF in 2003 that led the first Mardivs charge to Baghdad. After that he became the Chief of Staff. After that he became the Assistant Division Commander. That was 22 months in Iraq. Following that, he served in the Joint Staff J-3. He was later promoted to be the Deputy Commandant for Plans, Policies, and Operations. Subsequently commanded 1 MEF, became the Assistant Commandant, the ACMAC, in 2010. And in 2013, was given command of all U.S. and coalition forces as the ISAF Commander in Afghanistan. He became the 36th Commandant on 17 October. Welcome, General. Michelle Howard. Admiral Howard is the 38th Vice Chief of Naval Operations. On 1 July 2014, she made Navy history by being the first female officer to attain the four-star rank. She made DOD history by being the first African-American woman to attain four stars. A surface warfare officer, she took command of Rushmore in 1999, where again, she made history by being the first African-American woman to command a U.S. Navy warship. As commander of Amphibious Squadron 7, she participated in the tsunami relief efforts in Indonesia and led the maritime security operations in the North Arabian Gulf. Later, as the Expeditionary Strike Commander 
for ESG2 and also serving as Commander Task Force 151, she led the counter piracy efforts in the CENTCOM AOR. Welcome, Admiral Howard. Thank you. Admiral Paul Zukunft is the 25th Commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. He leads the largest component within the Department of Homeland Security. His prior flag assignments include Pacific Area Commander, Assistant Commandant for Marine Safety, Security, and Stewardship, Assistant Commandant for Capabilities, 11th Coast Guard District Commander. He also was a director of the Joint Interagency Task Force <coughs> West. Significantly, Admiral Zukunf served as the federal on-scene coordinator for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill of national significance in the Gulf. He's commanded six units, including CO of Cutters, Cutters Cape Wright, Harriet Lane, and Rush. We welcome Admiral Paul Zukunf. Thank you, sir. So for our leaders here, uh, if I had to kind of crush down what we did this week in the last couple days, I think that we kicked off with uh, Secretary Work, and he really did an excellent job of giving the overview of uh, what the department's trying to get done uh, with, this, uh, with the budget and with the resources. And of course, the theme of our conference talks, it's all about supply, demand, and resources. And uh, I think he made an excellent argument for the need to have a, a strategy-driven but budget-informed uh, approach. That said, through the past two, two and a half days, it became apparent that a lot of folks, although they want to see that happen, they're not so sure if it's going to happen. Because it's going to take uh, a lot of folks to pitch in and say, yes, we do need to give them the money they've asked for. And, uh, and there's also the concern, it's kind of an undercurrent between the lines of, well, if the Congress gets their hands on this and rearranges the chairs, you know, will we get the right outcome? So uh, the first thing I'd just like to kick off with a question for uh, the General Dunford. <clears throat> Sir, you, you assumed duties in October uh, as a commandant, and you came right from a combat theater as the ISAF commander. And then you're beamed back to Washington. You're doing the man, train, and equip function. And with that compare contrast, is there anything that surprised you, anything that popped out for you when you made that one to another leap? No, thanks, Pete. I, I'm not sure it was a complete surprise, but when I left uh, in 2012 first, uh, the op tempo seemed to be heading in a, in a different direction. In other words, coming out of Afghanistan, we made some assumptions that we'd get back to a more sustainable level of deployment to dwell. And so the first uh, surprise, if you will, when I came back was that all Marine forces were out of, were out of Afghanistan. But if you combine uh, the increased requirements that we had uh, between 2012 and 2014 with the drawdown of the force, we're running as fast as we were three or four years ago. In other words, as you measure the time that units are home between deployments, we're out for seven-month deployments. We're back for at or below 14 months, uh, below in, in many cases, and back out for seven months. If you combine that with the fiscal challenges that took place uh, and the impact on readiness, that really created a tension between our readiness, our modernization, and our infrastructure sustainment. When I left, I, th I guess my point is, when I left as assistant commandant, I thought I'd been, I'd been through some difficult times for those two years between 2010 and 2012. And, uh, and I think my successor, uh, General Jay Paxton, had it much worse than I did during his two years uh, as the assistant commandant. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Admiral Zukun. Um, we've heard a great deal about the DOD forces rebalancing. Um, a lot of folks out here in the Pacific really say, hey, we never really left. It's not about rebalancing. But clearly there's a difference in focus um, and rebalancing, if you will, to meet threats around the globe. How is the Coast Guard matching up with those DOD efforts? And do you have something that relates to the DOD focus on the Coast Guard side? Yeah. Um, as DOD and especially our Navy rebalances, and, and they must, between Putin expansionism, uncertainties in the Pacific, uh, a rising China, a very uncertain regime in North Korea, 
clearly the Navy needs to rebalance. Uh, what I look at, when you saw 68,000 unaccompanied minors cross the border, uh, and we were trying to find beds, we, the U.S. government, why were they leaving in the first place? Uh, if you were living in Honduras, Guatemala, or El Salvador, uh, you would put your child in the hands of human traffickers so they can come to the United States to depart the most crime-ridden regions in the world. Honduras today is more violent than Iraq was during the height of the insurgency during 2005. And unfortunately, it's trending in a negative direction. Roughly 40% unemployment, 50% poverty. Uh, but why are children being put in the hands of human traffickers and leaving is because organized crime has taken a hold in this region. Organized crime is a $750 billion enterprise and I don't think they have this thing called the Budget Control Act that they have to deal with. So where do those ill-gotten gains go is they undermine rule of law. So I have rebalanced, and in fact today I've got nine Coast Guard cutters in the transit zone, and between those nine Coast Guard cutters we've got about 10 tons of cocaine that we've seized just in the last month and a half. We've seized more product uh, this year to date than we did in all of 2013. Uh, but much of this credit, first it goes to our Navy, uh, where we have our law enforcement teams, and the other really is our national intelligence program. Eighty percent of these interdictions are led by one layer of intelligence. Uh, unfortunately, when I looked at rebalancing, we could act on the best of days in the past, maybe 20 percent of that 80 percent intelligence. Sixty percent get a, get a free pass. So if you can imagine looters in the street, and we're only going to act on 20 percent of it, uh, I can't sleep with that. So we've rebalanced to fill some of the gaps that have been created here in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and we're having pretty good results. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, for Admiral Howard, uh, of course, we've discussed the, uh, it's very, it looks good on paper, uh, the strong budget request. And there's some things in there that clearly the Navy's been um, trying to get done for a while. Um, but in the fiscally constrained environment, where would you say Navy is putting its most important focus and priority for the warfighter? Thank you for the question. And um, just to uh, lobby off the last question, when you talk about the rebalance to the Pacific, the reason I'm here today is because CNO is traveling around the Pacific meeting with allies and partners. In New Zealand. <coughs> In today. New Zealand, indeed. Um, so when you look at what makes the Navy a different military department compared to the other military departments, there are some warfighting capability and capacity that we share, whether it's air power, uh, ground forces, how we go about employment of that mission is what's different. But the one thing that stays true to the Navy is ships. We build carriers, we build ships, and we build submarines. And we're the only ones who do that. And so making sure that that Navy in being and then we have a Navy for the future, ten, remains the most important part of our, of our budget. Uh, and so we know as we're working our way through this budget cycle, we've focused on that. Where we have concerns is in the future. When we look at strategic deterrence as our priority mission, and you look at the Ohio submarine aging out, we know we're gonna have to replace her. And the cost for that is probably going to be on the order of $9 billion a platform. And that would arguably uh, consume about half of our shipbuilding account. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Commandant, maybe this is unfair for General Dunford, but as a former J3-er, I have to ask you this question. It always struck me that prior to 9-1-1, that the service components who were parked up under each of the COCOMs, they tended to broker uh, the COCOM's request and try to come up with a solution that was reasonable for that service. And after 911, I, I detected a shift where often the COCOM demand signal was a, was a pass through and sometimes the service component was aiding and abetting uh, an ever increasing request. Um, so if that component's role as a broker is diminished, my question to you is, do we have the tension right between supply and demand, and how would you like to see it work? Sure. First, Pete, uh, I still think the components are critically important. In fact, we just made a decision uh, a couple of months ago to make sure that none of our components were dual-hatted. You know, we just talked at lunch a little bit that in the past the Marine Corps very often had. In fact, when I was the 1MF commander, I was dual-hatted as the Mars Sent commander. 
Uh, we made a decision not to do that uh, in the fall as a result of our recognition of the importance of the component in dealing with the combatant commander setting the conditions, in our case, for the proper employment and proper sustainment of Marine forces. So I don't, I don't think the component's role has reduced. I do think that the combatant commander's requirements have increased, but increased relative to the security challenges that they have. In other words, I don't th some people look at it as an unsuppressed appetite, but in fact, I think it's a recognition of the challenges they're dealing with. They're simply asking for the forces that they need to implement the strategy and support their theater, theater campaign plan. So I recognize that. Uh, there is a great tension, though, between the supply and demand in the sense that uh, without going into great detail, we probably in this last global force management allocation process had the lowest <laughs> level of meeting the combatant commander's demands that I remember. And as you right. alluded to, I've spent some time in this business. And, and uh, so this time, you know, probably uh, as a percentage of their requests, you know, our, our, uh, what we met that with capabilities was less than it has been in the past. I think the tension is not so much uh, a lack of the component's role as it is that right now we're in the process of a drawdown. Uh, but the drawdown may not necessarily reflect uh, the challenges that we have, uh, particularly in the CENTCOM AO, the Pacific Command, which both have uh, increased demand. And so it's not so much, I think, a, a, a tension between the services and the combatant commander as it is a tension between uh, the overall inventory of the joint force and what the combatant commanders need to implement the strategy. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, for Admiral Zukunft, there's been much written lately about the geostrategic effects of energy production, oil. It's, uh, I think there's nothing on TV in the last three weeks that didn't include uh, some observation about oil, oil production, and the price of a barrel of oil. Um, what impact is that having on the Coast Guard? Because, uh, you know, it appears that this shifting or this pretty dynamic and historical shift yeah. is having a pretty big impact on the movement of that product, both inside and around the United States? Yeah. Well, the Coast Guard is also a regulatory agency in addition to be an armed service and a law enforcement service as well. Uh, so with the energy renaissance, if you go back three or four years, two million <coughs> barrels of oil went down the Mississippi River in 2012. This last year it went from two to 50. Uh, this last year alone, the United States uh, is hit a high point where we now produce more oil than we import, and by 2020, uh, we will be in the export business, especially as we look at the proliferation of natural gas. Uh, and on that note, you don't, you don't have to look any further than right here at NASCO Shipyard, you know, with those towed container ships being built, dual purpose, uh, fueled by LNG. But first and foremost, I need to make sure that my marine inspectors, these don't inspect marines, by the way, they, they inspect ships. Uh, <coughs> that they are leading industry uh, and ahead of this emerging technology. Uh, but there's going to be real GDP growth when you look at this energy renaissance. And this is an area that fascinates me. So I, I've met with all the major oil companies. I meet with the American Petroleum Institute. And I say, well, how long is this going to last? And quite honestly, he said, at least 25 to 30 years, you know, into 2040. So I need to take that planning factor into account of how do I shape the Coast Guard for the 21st century? Because at the end of the day, you want to be able to facilitate this commerce because 90% of it moves by water, uh, and that you don't become an impediment to this GDP potential that is here among our mist right now. Not to mention what it does for the United States, but then look at the geopolitics of oil. Look at the petrodollars uh, in, in a not as diversified economy as Russia. Look what brought the Cold War to an end. It was Russia's economy. And when you have the price of oil below $50 a barrel, and as long as Saudi Arabia keeps cranking it out, it has a clear impact on the government of Russia. Venezuela economy has failed. Uh, they rely on $120 per barrel or higher for that economy to remain vibrant. So if that now becomes a black hole, what becomes of Venezuela as we look going forward? And if you look at all the subsidies where Venezuela oil goes to, such as Cuba, you know, the ripple effect of oil is, is global, if far reaching. And with our natural gas production right now, the expansion of the Panama Canal, uh, we have LNG facilities be being built today in the United States that can push more LNG into the global market than there are gas carriers to build those ships right now. So it brings up one other challenge, and we'll probably get to that later. So when I visited this facility, uh, it's called Chenier LNG in Sabine, 
uh, River in Louisiana. They've got fences, lighting, there's crocodiles or alligators. But I said, well, what are you doing about the invisible threat? And well, what do you mean by the invisible threat? The cyber threat. So if you are a peer competitor with Russia, what are you doing to harden your cyber defenses? So there's another component where the Coast Guard's involved in not just moving ships, but also protecting these facilities. Uh, and we really need those universal standards for cyber defense as well, uh, as it affects our maritime commerce. Well, so, uh, just to follow, if I could just <clears throat> follow up for one second about resources. You know, uh, General Dunford just said, demand is your friend if that's what you need to do the job. You shouldn't see it that way as a tension between the COCOMs and the services. On the Coast Guard side, do you have the right level of resources to do all that right? Yeah. Um, what most people don't realize are the broad authorities we have. I have 61 treaties, bilateral agreements that cover drugs, weapons of mass destruction, fisheries, where the U.S. Coast Guard can board ships in the territorial seas right up to the surf zone of these signatory nations. Our authorities are far and broad reaching, and so there's no other entity. They, they copy our paint scheme, our racing stripe on our ships, but there's no other entity like the Coast Guard. So clearly the demand for services is on the uptick. We've got Arctic, uh, a whole new ocean has opened up. I mentioned counter drug, migrant flows, uh, but we find ourselves in a continuing resolution today. Uh, we need to clear that so I can finish our eighth national security cutter but the most important acquisition in Coast Guard history is going to be our offshore patrol cutter. And we're going to deliver that on my watch. Uh, today we have 50-year-old ships that are on the front lines doing operations. When that first OPC comes online, those ships will be 55 years old. Uh, we got to get this right because in 2060, these offshore patrol cutters are still going to be out there operating. And, and our folks operating those ships at that point in time, I want them to look back and say, thank God Admiral Z got this one right. Uh, if there's no other legacy, I need to make sure we get that right. But let's get right to the current situation. FY15, we're in a continuing resolution. For me, that's good. Uh, if there are anomalies that allow me to do new acquisition. Uh, now, why would I say that's good? Because if I get my authorized budget, it takes me below the water level, below the water level of post-sequestration 2013. Got it. That's a, that's a challenge for me. Emma Howard, you look like you wanted to jump in on well, an earlier point. <clears throat> there's, a, there's the one way of looking at energy and trade from the perspective of the United States. But even when you look at the fluctuating price of gas, and you go back as far as the 70s, and we had drops uh, in 72 after the oil embargo, yep. and then 79 after the Iranian revolution, when you look at trade and energy, uh, it's the flow around the world, commerce has only quadrupled at sea from that time frame. So then when you look at energy as part of that commerce flowing, it's be been between 50% to one third of that. So the global connectedness of the world has only intensified in the physical domain. So the, the choke points have remained the same, where the energy flows from, even as the type of energy changes and where it flows to, has been a pretty steady, steady pattern over the last 40 years. So you still end up being focused on, we as a, when you look at the global economy, focused on those choke points. And so even though that 17 million barrels a day coming through the Strait of Hormuz primarily flows to the Pacific, it flows to China, it flows to Japan, it flows to South Korea, and it flows to India. But if you look at their energy being disrupted and them not being able to produce the parts that generally flow to this country, then you start threading back through this connectiveness between our economies. And so wherever it's going to be, whether it's to or from the United States or it's out, out, out and about forward, trade and, uh, and the importance of trade to the global economies has only increased in this last century. Thank you. Um, this uh, skip over to back to uh, General Dunford for a minute. Um, General, uh, right now, it's, uh, it's pretty clear that we're challenged in um, both the uh, deployability and the numbers on amphibious shipping. And, uh, and you said in your recent uh, defense, or defense, commandant's planning guidance that uh, I quote, it says amphibious ships provide the most capable and flexible means of deploying and <coughs> employing Marines across the range of military operations. 
I'm a witness. It's very rare to have a service chief leader wearing a Navy uniform who's had as much amphibious experience sitting next to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. So what priority does advocacy for more amphibious ships and the connectors that go with them? General Amos was here last year, and we asked him this question about, you know, what's bugging you? And he said it's connectors, but yeah. could you talk about the ships and the connectors for a moment? Yeah, Pete, I'd, I'd start by saying that the real concern is making sure that the Navy Marine Corps team can meet its requirements to come from the sea and, and, and implement the strategy. That's, that's the critical piece. And amphibious ships are a piece of it. Uh, connectors are a piece of it. Uh, I think anybody knows that today, you talked about the combatant commander's demand signal a little while ago. If you really strip that down, there's a requirement for over 50 ships on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what, if you, if you ask, what are the combatant commanders asking for? We've got a, uh, a, an objective of 38. That's the requirement within the Department of the Navy. Uh, we've got a fiscally constrained objective of about 33. We've got an inventory right now of 31, and we've got some significant readiness challenges that we're working very closely with the CNO and the vice CNO to address. So it's very high on my list of priorities to get, to get back our amphibious capability. There is some good news uh, in that regard. Uh, the decision the Secretary of Navy made to replace the LSD with the LPD hull form is, uh, is a very positive step in that direction. I think the initiatives that uh, CNO has taken to improve the readiness of the amphibious fleet is also pretty important. The connectors is part of a broader issue, with, which is how do we deal with an anti-access area denial envir environment? How do we come from the sea and implement our operational concept of operational maneuver from the sea and ship to objective maneuver? And in that regard, uh, connectors are a critical piece of it. Uh, replacing the LCAC, replacing the LCU, both programs in place right now are critical uh, to the Marine Corps and to the Navy team, and, uh, and we're on top of that. But then we also have some issues inside of, our, uh, inside of the Marine Corps itself. The amphibious combat vehicle is also an important piece of the, the overall connector strategy. Our, our aviation capability, the CH-53 Kilo <coughs> is an important piece of the connector strategy. So I guess what I'd say is my priority is less about amphibious ships and connectors than it is about our ability to come from the sea. And then within that overall requirement, amphibious ships and connectors are probably the number one concern that I have. Well, thank you, uh, Admiral Howard. I heard from a Marine who will remain unnamed that, wow, we're so concerned about the world waking up one day without having a sufficient number of Marines deployed forward. And they see, they saw it, this person saw it, and it made an impression on me that, uh, that the Marines, frankly, in his view, were worried that if you didn't have enough lift, then there'd be insufficient Marines forward. And so now you see the Marines doing the special MAGTAF uh, contingency response, which is going to be shore-based. Um, has there been a good, healthy discussion about really getting to the from the sea and the STOM aspects of this? And, you know, it's a difficult resource issue, but you have a deep background in this area, and I wondered what your So we was. continue uh, to build amphibious ships, as the Commandant just said, and, you know, uh, and remain committed. And then when you look at particular this last budget where uh, we we're committing the money to LPD 28. Uh, Congress offers up some and we say, well, you know, great opportunity. Let's put in the 500 million to complete that ship. Though that is going to continue to thank you to move forward. The you know, we we have a unique and singular capability that uh, this nation deserves to have for as long as this nation exists. And um, I, I have no fear that that is not a focus of the U.S. Navy. C can I jump on that for a minute? Just, uh, sure. You mentioned the Special Purpose Marine Air Ground Task Forces, and we have two forward right now, one Special Purpose MAGTAF Crisis Response in AFRICOM, uh, one in CENTCOM. Uh, both of them are a recognition of the shortfall of amphibious capability, but the continuing requirement for crisis response uh, inside of both AFRICOM and CENTCOM. So the requirement for crisis response, particularly in what's called a new normal, our ability to respond to our diplomatic posts and interest overseas have, hasn't gone away. But I, but I think there's got to be another answer besides just amphibious ships. I just laid out for you briefly what the inventory is, and we're not going to get there from here uh, if we don't take a look at alternative means of putting Marines to sea. The key is on a day-to-day -day basis is making sure Marines are at sea. So one thing we're working very closely on, and, and I happen to be down here for the christening of the uh, the, the uh, USNS Jesty Puller uh, last Saturday, we were look, working on very closely our alternative platforms, not as a substitute uh, for an amphibious ship, 
not, an, not as a substitute for a warship, but as an opportunity to get Marines to see to be more responsive to the combatant commanders. So one of the things we're taking a look at now are two specific cases where we have Marines shore based and we'd like to get them to see. Uh, in AFRICOM, uh, we'll, we'll take a look this time, this year now, at a, at a concept of operations that would use alternative platforms to get those to Marines to see and be more flexible in that case for, for General Rodriguez. We also have Marines down in Darwin now. Uh, we've had up to 1,000. We'll grow to 2,500. And we want those Marines, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, on a day-to-day -day basis to do the kind of forward engagement necessary and also give them uh, a crisis response capability. And so we're not going to be able to do that uh, using solely amphibious ships. And so another, another key piece of, uh, of implementing a strategy from my perspective is, uh, is being more creative with the use of alternative platforms, and, and we're committed to doing that. CNO has already put money against a number of those platforms to make sure they're V-22 capable, make sure we put the investment in command and control systems that allow them to provide the proper support for Marines, again, both from an engagement perspective and from a crisis response perspective. So, we, you know, this is one of those where we, we not only have to get the amphibious fleet uh, healthy, uh, and we not only have to replace the LSD, but we also have to look at other means of meeting the requirements. Because even if we get to the 33 ships, as we will sometime later, about four to six years from now, we'll have 30, 33 ships, and, and that's probably what we can expect to have. The requirement, again, is somewhere between 33 and the 50 I mentioned earlier. So we've got to we've got to do the best we can to close that gap. And I think there are other solutions we can look at. One more question in this area, and I and I'm gonna, I promise I'll come back to the Coast Guard, but I like to finish this thought is that uh, you know the Marines it's, it's no flash traffic there's no Z in front of the state time group that the Marines have spent a lot of time ashore in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, during the period since 911 uh, both in combat and OIF and the follow-on and obviously Afghanistan where from which you just came uh, is is there a cultural challenge here of and, and I want to stipulate that the Marines never missed a MU deployment during that whole time. But is there a cultural issue of getting the Marines back and thinking naval uh, in, in, that you have to take on at this juncture? No, thanks, Pete. I, to me, it's less, uh, it's less a cultural issue than it is an education issue. You know, I, and, and as an example, we're starting from the top. One of the things we did when we had the three stars together in January is we had a three-day session. We spent one half uh, of one day of those three days just educating uh, our three stars on, on ship's characteristics and the threat uh, threats associated with the anti-access area denial environment so that we could be true naval officers and sit there as partners uh, with the CNO, the vice CNO, and the staff and actually talk about these from a naval perspective. And so, and that'll permeate the entire organization. But, but there's also some physical pieces of it, which is simple things like being able to get vehicles on and off ships, load plans, uh, right. uh, deck landing qualifications. I mean, it's, the, it's the, uh, the basic tactics, techniques, and procedures associated with coming from the sea that certainly across the force, uh, there's a little bit of rust to bust. But as you pointed out, uh, we have not missed a Marine Expedition Unit deployment throughout the last 13 years of war. So it isn't that we've gotten away from it. It's just that the capacity that we've dedicated to that has been reduced. We very much, uh, starting now three or four years ago, uh, started to ramp up our exercises, had great cooperation from the fleets on both coasts uh, to, to get our bold alligator and Don Blitz series to, again, get back, get back to the sea, if you will. But, but to me, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's less a uh, cultural issue than it is just simply focusing uh, our day-to-day -day routine on coming from the sea, making sure our exercise program is dedicated to the development of capabilities associated with that. And, uh, and then the education piece as well, and, and we're working all three of those. Thank you. Um, this is the first question from the audience, uh, and I'll, I'll put this first to Admiral Zukunft. Uh, uh, this is from Jake Ferreira, Mission Readiness Organization. Uh, currently more than 70 percent of the 17 to 24-year-olds in America are unable to serve in the military due to some disqualifier. It's either education or physical uh, crime. Uh, what are some of the appropriate military and private sector investments that should be made in the future generations? And ultimately, um, who will be responsible or who should be responsible for that? Is that the military's to fix or is that the country's to fix? Yeah. I'll just say as a, as a service chief, we are bringing the, the best talent that this nation can bring to bear. Uh, and maybe, maybe one out of 20 of our high school seniors are, are eligible for military duty. Uh, whether it's for fitness, aptitude, uh, you name it. 
but we're out of that one out of 20. Uh, we are clearly getting what I'm seeing is the best and brightest talent that I've seen in my Coast Guard career. Uh, I can hang my head over the budget, uh, but what causes me to hold my head high is the caliber of our workforce. Uh, to see it firsthand, I sponsored a company uh, at our recruit training center in Cape May, New Jersey uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there was one company, there's, there's 60 in a company, and I said, well, how many have your diplomas? 100%. How many of you went to college? Out of that 60, nearly 50. How many have your associate's degree? 40. How many have your master's degree? 24. Who has a uh, bachelor's degree? Master's degree, 9. PhD, 1. To be an E2 in the United States Coast Guard. And so, well, why'd you join the Coast Guard? I want to save lives. I want to do law enforcement. I want to be part of a military service. Uh, they're 24, 25 years old. Uh, they have life experiences. Uh, but they know that this is a pretty darn good deal because they're part of something bigger than who they are. Uh, where I do them a disservice is that I don't empower them when they go out and take to the field. And so we are empowering E4s and E5s to run three, four million dollar boats here off San Diego, pursue pangas loaded with drugs, 140 miles in a boat, um, and then they're doing warning shots, disabling <coughs> fire, arresting them, and they're 25, 26 years old. Um, the biggest challenge I have going forward is when I talk to the Harbor Police Chief here, he's got 120 officers, I said, well, how many are Coast Guard? So about 40. Uh, when I talk to the other law enforcement, so, you know, I am recruiting, training, and growing uh, subject matter experts, but then the headhunters are, are taking them away from me. Uh, that's a good thing, uh, because we then cross-pollinate with, with interagency, but I could not be more delighted officer and enlisted with the caliber of people uh, that are taking the oath to support and defend our Constitution of the United States. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Howard, how would you comment on the, the people, the quality of the people? And So uh, the first thing I would, you know, as I talk and talk to our sailors and then talk to groups outside of the Navy, I remind folks 9-11, and I remind them that probably about 60% of our force has come in since 9-11. These are young men and women who joined the military, eyes wide open. I mean, it wasn't just a theoretical, this could be a potential sacrifice of your life for ideals. It was a very real possibility. That is astounding to me. You know, the military is less than 1% of this nation, and yet we've got this generation is an amazing group of patriots who continue to join, whether they come in as an officer through OCS or Annapolis or, or enlist and come in knowing what might happen to them. And their families continue to support them. This, this is an inspiring group to lead, and this is a group that some days you gotta look in the mirror and go, am I the right leader for this group? So I, I'm not worried about who's, who's coming in or that there's not a pool. This generation has shown we have the citizens we need to volunteer and serve in the military. In the larger aggregate, if there are issues, literally with the health of the American public, then it is all of our responsibilities as adults and citizens to make sure we're a better people. Thank you. Um, for the comment, I throw you the same question, but I, I have a little twist to it, is that uh, certainly peace has not broken out all over, but it's definitely true that there's less Marines in combat, direct combat today than there were uh, you know, a couple years ago. So does that present a challenge where you have a certain amount of adrenaline and identification with that activity, you know, direct combat activity, and now you go back to the future to deterrence and a float, uh, you know, presence type missions, surely to be ready, but you're, you're, you might not be in the direct action. Does that present, uh, you know, issues for you? Uh, Pete, it hasn't yet, and uh, and while well, it's not as much on the front page of the news uh, as Afghanistan and Iraq, I can tell you about one special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force yesterday. Uh, one squadron of Harriers is flying strike missions into Iraq and Syria. One squadron of V-22s with Marines is conducting the tactical recovery and aircraft and personnel mission uh, for that. Uh, a couple hundred Marines are in al-Assad training uh, Iraqi security forces. From the same unit, one rifle company was conducting the evacuation of Yemen. And from the same 2,500-man <coughs> unit, other Marines were in Jordan conducting training. 
So what I've told the Marines and I'm out in the West Coast all week speaking to them that uh, the nature of the fight may change, but the demand signal for Marines has remained high. And as I alluded to in my opening remarks, uh, our units are cycling, uh, you know, at a, at a greater than one to two deployment to dwell. Our F-18 squadrons are home for about 10 or 11 months between deployments right now. Right. Uh, and there's other, there's other organizations in the same boat. So uh, I promise Marines that uh, they'll be busy, and uh, every indication is that they will. I, I don't think peace is breaking out. The, the nature of the challenges is different, but, uh, but actually more complex from my perspective. Well, thank you. Uh, I'd like to shift to cyber. Uh, you know, General Zukunf touched on it, I mean, excuse me, Admiral Zukunf touched on it earlier. And, uh, but the cyber thing is, uh, has been pretty interesting this week. Of course, the nature of our audience, the nature of our whole conference here has a strong cyber network flavor to it. But uh, it's very clear that there's a tremendous focus on this, that uh, people know they've got to have the systems that we're going to field in the future born better for cyber, cyber protect. Uh, but at the same time, there's a very sobering message that came across, at least to me, that the stuff that's already out there is uh, really, really hard. So I'd just like to ask uh, where you see the cyber issue. Um, and I also would like to start with Admiral Howard on this one because I think the Navy is going to raise this to a domain and uh, and to a higher level in its uh, in the forthcoming strategy. And just wanted to hear your thoughts about it, Admiral Howard, first. So it, it's it's or years ago proclaimed a domain under in the joint world. Um, so I, where we're going is we're clearly integrating it more into our sense as war fighters. And over decades, we've become very comfortable uh, with the land domain, with the air domain, with space, and now it's time for us to bring our awareness of this domain and what it means to us as operators and integrate it more throughout our workforce. What's fascinating about this domain is that's not just active duty sailors. That's reservists and that's civilians. That the way this domain has grown, everybody's in it and an operator every day. Uh, and so when you look at reviewing what are the right training policies for that workforce who are operators, or an entry point for someone, and then what are the right policies for the experts and training for the experts. Uh, we're moving through that pretty quickly and working our way to, I think, being the leader in understanding this domain and being the premier war fighters in this domain. Thanks. Admiral Zukunf, you, there's a, obviously for you, there's a critical infrastructure protect and a slightly different aspect to this. Yeah. Um, so again, over 90% of our commerce moves by sea. Uh, and to really drive that point home, fly over LA Long Beach right now, uh, you'll see 36 ships sitting out at anchor. Uh, about over half of those are loaded container ships. Uh, now this is a little bit of a man-made situation, um, but it, what it brings to bear is the lack of resiliency uh, in that just-in-time inventory that relies on on-time reliable shipping. Uh, what most people don't realize is that, you know, it, as commerce picks up and there's quicker throughput in our ports, about 95% of that activity in the port is fully automated. Uh, but the only manual aspect of that is when a truck driver drives a truck under the gantry and he drives that, that box off the property. Uh, and so there's a, a critical need right now. We actually regulate these, these facilities. Uh, we've done so under the Maritime Transportation Security Act of 2002. And quite honestly, industry wasn't real happy about they needed fences, they needed credentials, closed circuit TVs, safeguards, barriers, and the like. Now they're coming to us, and this really came to a head right after the Sony attacks of saying, Coast Guard, how do we harden our defenses against a cyber attack? So we have industry coming to us wanting to be better regulated, which is a bit of a twist. Um, but so we need to come up with those universal standards because you know that that network is only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, and so industry has made some great strides, but it could be another link, a subcontractor just upstream from that that could remotely shut down that facility and have a situation like we have on the West Coast right now where our industry is shut down. Uh, LA Long Beach, it's a, it's a $1 billion a day throughput. It affects 5 million jobs downstream, so it has a huge impact 
on, on our nation's GDP. So it's critical to our economic security. And so if people really want to study, study this hard, and, and then how do you really throw a monkey wrench you know, into our economy, look, look no further than cyber. So we will roll out a cyber strategy uh, because we work in the .mil, .com, .gov domain in the Coast Guard, uh, and I expect to have that rolled out. We're running it through the interagency uh, across DHS, DOJ, and others, obviously with Cybercom, and expect to have that on the street next month. Thank you. I was going to offer General Dunford a chance to comment on cyber. If you sure, have no, that'd be good. I, for, for me, there's really three major issues that, that we have to address in cyber. First of all, our, you know, protection of our network, and, and I'm satisfied we've got pretty good plans in place there. Uh, fiscal uh, environment has made, made it tough to make some decisions, uh, and I think we're probably under-resourced in that regard. The other is the responsibility that we have to provide uh, capability to the Joint Force. And I think you know uh, Cybercom has assigned uh, various combatant commanders to the services, and our, our responsibility is to provide Special Operations Command with support. And, uh, and I can tell you that they're, they're satisfied with what we're doing, uh, if not satisfied with the overall capacity. The one area where I think we really need to focus on now is cy cyber is both a challenge and an opportunity. And we spend less time talking about the opportunity that's out there in cyberspace and, and much more talking about the challenge. And what I've asked the team to really take a hard look at is how does the Marine Air Ground Task Force leverage joint offensive cyber capabilities uh, in order to be uh, more effective as a Marine Air Ground Task Force. And, uh, and that's something that we'll, we'll, we'll pay a lot of attention to here in the next seven months. Thank you, sir. Uh, for Admiral Howard, this question from Mike Salvedo, Lockheed Martin. Hi, Mike. Classmate. If ships, it, his question is, if ships are the Navy's main focus and the fleet is already strained to meet the COCOM requirements for missions like maritime ballistic missile defense, why were the Aegis DDG modernizations reduced in this year's budget request? He sees a conflict there, and I don't know if you were, if that's too detailed, but maybe you have a comment on that. Well, overall, we're continuing and committed to building uh, two DD, DDGs a year. Then it's looking at where's our best balance. And like the Marine Corps, if you just looked at what the COCOM demand is, and we've totaled that up over the years, in a year we would have a 450 ship Navy. And so the, I think the big question uh, leaders will always ask themselves, is the force size to win a most likely war or is the force size for the day-to-day -day demand? Uh, and over the years, we've come to have an armed force that's sized for the most likely, likely war. So we, <coughs> we c will continue to build um, uh, DDGs and then look at this great balance between how much BMD do we need in the immediate future based off mission sets and then how do we continue to build on for the long term? Thank you. Um, I've read a few of the audience questions. I'm going to take the liberty to integrate it into one larger question because there's several on the same theme. But we had a, um, we had a terrific panel yesterday at lunch where we talked about the challenges that industry has and the tendency for defense companies to be defense companies and for commercial companies to be commercial companies. And it's difficult. And sometimes commercial companies are now saying, I don't want to do what it takes to be a defense company. And we talked in terms of walls and how, how do you overcome those walls. And it was particularly intriguing in the uh, context of technology and innovation. Because if increasingly the answers are on the outside of the wall with commercial solutions, how do we best bring that in uh, to defense? And uh, I'd just like to ask for comments on that. I was going to give, uh, give Admiral Zukunt the first crack at that one. How do you innovate in that environment? Yeah. Uh, well, one advantage, this is my seventh assignment as a flag officer, so I haven't been able to hold a job. But uh, in one of those, <laughs> uh, I was actively involved in uh, writing the operational requirements for the offshore patrol cutter. Uh, from a field operator's perspective, but also from an acquisition. Uh, and, and then how do you make it affordable? Uh, and oftentimes when people hear the word affordable, it's a, it's a race to the bottom. Um, but we came in with, with, with reliable requirements that I foresee for the 21st century of what a ship is going to need to have to operate for 40 years. I can't predict what's gonna happen in 2060. 
Um, but I want to make sure that I have a ship that can operate in the harshest of environments, whether it's climate change, we're called to do disaster response, but for you know, a very <coughs> ambiguous threat environment that we get those requirements right. Uh, we then made a huge investment in our acquisition program, so much so that last year the Coast Guard received five of eight uh, of the federal government acquisition awards. All of our acquisition programs uh, last year, overall, we had 1% growth. So I'm pretty proud of what they've been able to do, and especially when you go on our national security cutter, our fast response cutters, these are game changers. Uh, this is a quantum leap from where we were to where we are to where we're taking these platforms into the 21st century. And we'll do the exact same thing with the offshore patrol cutter as well because we've got our requirements right. We did not change them midstream, and I think that's the important part. The hardest thing for me working with industry is I do not have a reliable and a predictable budget. Uh, if, if I have to delay a shipbuilding project because I don't have that acquisition dollars, because our acquisition budget went down 40% over the last four years, I could not build an aircraft carrier. In fact, that, that would break my bank. Um, but that's the hard part, and that's the piece I need to do my job in, in convincing those who oversee us. The impact that it has on jobs, on industry, not just to meet my needs, but also for those in the shipbuilding industry as well. Uh, because I am darn proud of the products that are being delivered on time and on budget today. Thank you. Admiral Howard, how would you characterize this challenge of innovating in this environment? Well, I think some of it is we need to have stronger dialogues with industry over the talent management. Uh, over the last um, few months as I've been BCNL, I've gone to different groups, um, Carnegie Mellon, Cordell, and uh, talked about technology, talked about where we're going, groups like IDA, and then looked at how we're developing our people and then talked to different groups where we have officers across the armed forces as interns with uh, some companies that are very clearly directly aligned with a uh, war fighting effort, but other, other companies that are less directly aligned with war fighting effort. It is fascinating to me as we developed, um, have developed some great civilians send them to a master's program, um, send uh, um, an enlisted guy to NPS to get his master's degree. When I sit there and I ask the leadership of the institute, you know, where did these people go? Um, Google? Okay. So we clearly have innovators and we have the talent we have, but we're going to have to have a great conversation with industry so that we understand and want to strengthen our relationship and not steal our people from each other. That's, that's step one. But we also, I think, for our own people, have to help them understand we value, value innovation and we value them when we send them on these in internships. And we want to, want to have them stay and help lead us into the next century. Thank you. I'd like to put the same question to General Dunford. Obviously, the Marines, uh, with the combat situation since 911, had a real life and death requirement in some cases to field things quickly, to innovate and adapt. But now moving forward, we still hear that these barriers are there. Right. It's hard to do business with the government, and our requirements process and our acquisition process is difficult. What's your view? First of all, I agree with that, and uh, and we have some small cases of success, but I, but I, without mentioning the company, when the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle uh, work was initially started, uh, the former Vice Chief of Staff of the, Ar of the Army and myself worked very hard to incentivize uh, one of the major automotive uh, companies to compete, and uh, made a couple of visits uh, up there to see him, uh, and a number of other people were working to do that, and that autom autom automotive company was actually very interested in doing it. Uh, I think they viewed it as enhancing their brand, and I also think there was kind of a strain of patriotism where they felt like it'd be something for their company to actually make the vehicle that the Army and the Marine Corps was going to drive. But after about 18 months of frustration uh, in dealing with the process as it currently exists and the rigidity in the process, uh, they decided not to do it. The only, uh, for all the cynics in the crowd, if you said something like acquisition reform and we need to change the rules and so forth, folks have been working at this for 10 or 15 years will roll their eyes and say it's impossible. <clears throat> but, but here's why I'm a little bit encouraged. Uh, both Senator McCain as the chairman of the Senate Armed Service Committee and uh, Congressman Thornberry as the chairman of the House Armed Service Committee have identified two priorities uh, for their tenure. 
Uh, one is to eliminate sequestration. The second is to deal with acquisition reform. So I think what you'll see is a series of hearings, uh, and it'll be very much part of, I think, our testimony uh, in conjunction with the budget here over the next several weeks, this whole issue of acquisition. And so what we're going to do internally right now is identify uh, where we can those areas where there's, uh, there's things that inhibit uh, or, or actually uh, prevent, uh, in some cases, commercial industries or uh, others from, uh, from competing and try to bring those up in these series of hearings, because it is going to require a combination of what uh, Secretary Kendall is doing uh, in, right. in terms of acquisition reform within the department, but it's also going to require some changes in the law. Uh, and, uh, and both of those, I think, are on the table in a way that they probably haven't been over the last few years. I mean, I think the sense of frustration uh, with acquisition has hit a crescendo uh, in D.C., and, uh, and that may very well be what's necessary for us to affect change. Thank you. Um, you know, it seems to me that a huge part of innovation is sending a signal that the exchange, it's okay to exchange ideas. And uh, I've been reading a lot on blogs and, you know, talking to some junior folks recently, well, really over the last couple years, about what they perceive as a increasing, like a, almost like a political correctness that's seeping down from the top and they feel more pressure than before uh, to toe a certain line. And it seems to me that it's a dangerous situation if they ever feel like they can't honestly let their views be known and truly have an unfettered exchange of ideas. So I was wondering, what did you think of that? And the Navy, there was a pretty, uh, pretty big study with was kind of a grassroots thing about trust. You know, do you trust your leaders? And that was what you heard a lot was, I feel like I'm getting the party line, but I'm also being asked to innovate, have ideas, and bring them. You know, which side are we on? So I'd ask uh, maybe Admiral Howard to take the first crack at that one. What well, well I first, first of all, that's great feedback for me. Um, as I've traveled around and had all hands calls, I, I find our sailors are just as delightly, delightfully fearless as they were when I was serving out on the waterfront and what they're willing to ask questions on, challenge me on. Um, and I think it's just fantastic. You know, you, I go speak to uh, foremen who are, who are uh, teachers at the medical school and, the, you know, a young man will stand up and talk for five minutes about cyber and what it means to him and, you know, what are we doing about it? And I think that is exactly what I need to hear. So I, I don't know about this body or this grassroots study, but I'm not getting that as I talk to our folks. Okay. They're, they're wonderfully courageous. But would you agree that it's important that they feel like the signal from their leaders is to get out there and bring it? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Good. Admiral, Admiral Zukunf, do you have, I don't, I don't have as close a touch on this in the Coast Guard, but any ideas on this topic? Yeah. Um, one way we stay connected with, uh, with our workforce is through Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook. So I have public uh, outward looking uh, pages on each of those uh, and we get a lot of feedback uh, and I need to be able to get a sense of what's happening at the deck plate level. Uh, I spend about 30 percent of my time in the Coast Guard um, by that doing the all hands like, like Admiral Howard but I really need to spend 70 percent of my time in marketing and sales. Um, be able to pick those great stories up and the challenges that, that our workforce is seeing. Uh, something as fundamental as, as child care and you may say, well, what's the big deal about child care? Well, we have dual income families. Uh, we have young kids. We have forces that deploy or stand watches around the clock. So take Boston, for example. It's some of the most expensive child care in the country. Uh, and people are making career decisions based on whether they have child care or not, because in the private sector, they've got a child care program. So I need to make sure that I don't lose sight of what is it. I'm an empty nester. I remember what it was like trying to you know, run a household, get kids to school. I never had it easier now because I don't have to deal with all of those challenges. But those are the challenges that our, our young people face today, and they're going to be our future leaders of tomorrow. And I need to know what's preventing them from staying on my team as we make these great investments. But sometimes it's something as fundamental as child care. Or why do we move every two or three years? I just extended tour lengths for several thousand 
Coast Guard members said, hey, we, we've just gotten trained, you're qualified, uh, you're in a home, the kids are stable, you're gonna stay there longer than you had planned to. Are you okay with that? And they're quite thankful that we are. So something as fundamental as whether it's childcare, tour lengths, fewer moves, um, but it's good for our families. But if we lose sight of our family units, uh, we're gonna lose our people as well. And they're the ones we need to yeah. keep in the 21st century. Thanks. Uh, General Dunford, ideas on that, about yeah. that square and that circle between a hierarchical military organization, but you also need the bottom-up ideas and innovation. Yeah, first of all, uh, Pete, you mentioned a minute ago uh, the changes we made over the last 10 years, the adaptations we made. And, uh, and I can tell you that the majority of the ideas uh, came from the bottom and, uh, and then were embraced by senior leadership and then put into effect, so it's, it's really important. On the one hand, I would tell you, you know, <coughs> Marines are always proud and we always talk about innovation throughout our history from close air support in Nicaragua to amphibious capability between the wars, the F-35, the V-22. But interesting, you asked me the question today because uh, I've been telling a story this week uh, on this very issue, and it's a story about a captain, 1993, 1995, that was writing a series of articles about the IED threat. And he was writing about South African vehicles with V-shaped hulls and a need for the Marine Corps to think about this threat and change the way we were building our vehicles in the 1990s. That captain's now a colonel here at Marine Corps Recruit Depot San Diego, and I've been using that anecdote uh, as I've gone around and talked to Marines to say, look, uh, we can't afford to have good ideas be on the table and the first thing that happens to those good ideas be the antibodies come out and say, hey, that's not a good idea. We've got to be willing to listen. And, uh, and so I use some very positive examples about, about innovation. The three, three words I've, I've chosen to put on the cover of my planning guidance is adapt, uh, is innov innovate, adapt, and win. Uh, and clearly the innovation piece is, is really critical for us. But I am not comfortable uh, that we at all times have the climate within which those ideas get filtered up to the top. And I think that has to be a, it has to be a priority for leadership to be able to do that. Thank you. Um, okay, another question from the audience. Um, this is from Jesse Holer from Bloomberg LP. Um, for any panel member who'd like to try it. In the current constrained environment, what are your technology procurement priorities from industry? Maybe broaden that a little bit, is what would you like to see um, industry do for you? And uh, I'll give this first to Admiral Zukun. Yeah, uh, well I talked to earlier about the quality of our intelligence program. That's using obviously all sources and that's about all I can say here. Uh, we're now we're able to target 80% of the flow. Uh, but where's, where does coca, where does it grow? Uh, it usually grows in areas where you can't do aerial spraying. Uh, and so, uh, and you have to use aerial spraying because if Columbia sends in ground forces to do eradication, there's IEDs and <coughs> people are killed. So through technology, uh, using laser radar technology, you can look through triple canopy you have a, a 3D view if there's a roadway that goes through that, but you could see clandestine labs. Uh, you can see whether a semi-submersible uh, that might move weapons, drugs, you name it, uh, that might be built under triple canopy. So that's been an area of, of vulnerability for us right now. Uh, speaking for the Department of Homeland Security, uh, there are a number of congressmen right now that, that want to see a zero tolerance for any illegal crossing of our border to the south. That in itself raises a huge challenge for us uh, and a very expensive one. But is there technology that, that can bring that to bear as well? So uh, Dr. Reggie Brothers would be the person you'd want to talk to. He oversees the Science and Technology Department of the Department of Homeland Security that provides that seed money, the grant money. Uh, we have uh, relationships right now in the Coast Guard uh, with, with Harvard, with Rutgers, with MIT, and a number of others. Uh, and, and we put doctoral candidates on some of these technical challenges that we face, and it's paying huge dividends for us. Thank you. This will be, this discussion right now will be our last question, so I'd like to give the Navy and the Marine Corps a shot at the, what do you want from industry? Well, all I want to do right now is thank industry. So uh, serendipitous. Last week, every other year, we hold a science and technology conference hosted by the Office of Naval Research. Uh, and it was last week in um, DC, and it was the best attended we've ever had. Probably over 3,000 folks from both inside the Navy research labs and industry coming. Uh, and it was just a wonderful success. And out of that conference, 
we, we put, uh, O&R put out about 350 grants for exploration of different ideas of topics. So truly appreciate the partnership with industry. Uh, they're turning out for that conference and their willingness to help us explore new ideas. The one area that I uh, have been asking where I think anyone, whether you're in industry, private corporation, armed forces, or any federal agency, is if anybody could get after big data, autonomous uh, ability to work our way through big data, more autonomous in, in understanding what that picture is out there in the landscape of what is happening. Um, I think we're gonna have to get out of a thought process where there's all this information that's flowing around whether you're Bank of America or Sony, understanding whether you're gonna be attacked and think that's gonna be able to be managed with human beings in front of computers. So when you look at artificial intelligence, autonomy and, and harnessing and figuring out our way through big data, the person who comes up with that, we're all gonna hug. Roger that. Um, General Dumper, you get the last word. No, great, and I'm, I'm glad someone asked that question. First, we need some help on weight. Uh, weight of the load of our individual Marines and weight of over all of our equipment. Uh, we used to worry about square and cube when we loaded ships, and now we worry about weight as well. And then we've got the human factors of what we put on an average Marine uh, over the last few years as we've tried to make sure they had adequate protection. And so the weight of our overall equipment, both individually and, and uh, in our vehicles and so forth, is, is one. The second would be to come up with uh, a high-speed, self-deploying amphibious vehicle that provided protection against the threat and came in within cost. Uh, and, then, and then probably, uh, probably the, uh, the third one, uh, appropriate enough here for FC, is as, as I look at the transformational capability uh, of the F-35, what I want to make sure is, is that the Marine Air Ground Task Force is in a position to fully leverage the kinetic and the non-kinetic capabilities of that platform. And that'll be a particular focus for us here in the next couple of years. Thank you. Well, I'd like to g ask the audience to uh, give a big hand to our sea service leaders. Well, Admiral Zukun, um, Admiral Howard, and General Dunford, I know there's a lot of other places you could be, and there's other things that you could be doing than right here in San Diego with the AFCA and USNI uh, West Conference. So we really want to thank you for, for being here, taking the time out of your schedule to come. And as a to uh, token of our gratitude, we'd like to provide you with a copy of Fire on the Water, China, America, and the Future of the Pacific by Robert Haddock. And inside you'll find the AFCA.